Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's good to see the Reenstress here. Welcome to Cedar Lake. It's good to see the newlyweds here. Welcome back to Cedar Lake. And uh, it's good to see the rest of you. Um, I know some of you are joining us online. Uh, you're watching us on TV. Maybe you're listening to us on the radio and we want to give you a special welcome as well to the Cedar Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you are here or on the radio or on TV worshiping with us, perhaps for the first time, we'd like to invite you to come back and keep coming back because this is a place where we worship God. We have uh, something unique during our announcement time because we started to read the Bible together as a church family this week. And I thought perhaps as an educator that I would give a quiz this morning. And uh, just out of curiosity, and perhaps this is something that teachers do, how many of you did your homework? How many of you read through part or some of the chapters this week? Raise your hands, okay. Oh, there's a good, good uh, amount of us who read through the readings this week. And uh, I have to apologize to our students. We didn't fill you in on the chapters, but we would love for you to join us in reading through the Bible this year. And uh, what we'll do is we'll let you know what those chapters are for this week so that next week you can do well on our quiz. Now our AV team, I believe, is gonna put up the first question. And uh, there are some slides. And if they don't have access to them, that's okay. I can read you the first question. Um, that's number three. We'll go straight to number three. And we'll skip one and two or maybe come back to them. But number three asks this question. The Lord sent the animals in by twos and sevens. So the twos would be the unclean animals and sevens for the clean animals. So let's, let's study together here. How many hippos went into the ark. How many of you believe by raising your hands that it was by twos? All right, hands down. How many of you believe it was by sevens? All right. The church, you're just, okay, all right. The church is, uh, is correct in its majority that it was by twos. Now, we're on to halfway through our textbook here, and the material's getting more difficult, Professor Smith, and alpacas, how many, two or seven? How many of you believe that alpacas went in by twos? Raise your hands. Oh, not quite as confident. How many of you believe by sevens? Oh, we have a split, Pastor Gibbs. Pastor Gibbs, do you want to uh, give us some clarity on alpaca? If you look at the feet, they're like a camel. Okay, you guys hear that? If you look at the feet, they're like a camel, which tells us that there were two of each of those alpacas. Now, okay, what about giraffes? Giraffes, two or seven. How many of you believe two? Raise your hands. How many of you believe seven? Raise your hands. Oh, we have more sevens. And I see uh, Alex back there. And I'm going to call you out, Alex. Why do you believe that they were in by sevens? Two is the correct answer? Okay. How many of you believe by seven? Why, Mrs. Connor? <laughs> she's been to the Ark Encounter. She's learned. And what did you learn? They are clean. But why? They have split hooves and they chew their cud. So Pastor Gibbs is welcoming us to bring giraffe goulash to potluck next week. So it's a clean animal. Uh, 
some giraffe burgers to accompany the tofu burgers that would be in here. All right, let's, uh, let's do one or two more. Um, do you have any more slides? Okay, this is according to our week's reading, which began in Genesis 3. What is the first thing that God makes? Okay, beginning in Genesis 3 and onward in our reading, what is the first thing that God makes? Okay, what do you think, Maddie? All right, that's in Genesis 1. <laughs> Hunter has an answer. <laughs> he made what? People. He did make people. You're absolutely right. He made you and he made me, but that was in Genesis 1 as well. Any Oh, here we go. Haben. He created light, yes, in Genesis 1, but we're beginning in Genesis 3 and onward. What is it? That was very good, Javier. Very enthusiastic, as we know you are. Okay, a promise, but I'm looking for something tangible. Elder Williams. Yes, yes. If you look at Genesis 3, verse 21... Genesis 3, 21, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Very good, Elder Williams. You get an extra star this Sabbath morning. One more question. Two more questions? What's that? <laughs> One more. Well, for the sake of time, Pastor Gibbs, we want to give you time. But now you're going to have to cut the sermon short. So, number two, what chapter is the Tower of Babel found in? Raise your hand, scholars. Tim. Yes, it is Genesis chapter 11 where we find the story of the Tower of Babel. One more question. Thank you, Tim. You also get a gold star. Who was named Edom in the book of Genesis? Who was named Edom in the book of Genesis? I heard it. Oh, Wow, my lovely wife got that one right. Extra, extra credit this Sabbath morning for the beautiful lady here near the front. All right. Well, perhaps the elder next, next week will also uh, quiz us. But this, is just, this was just a uh, fun exercise for us as a church to review what we have been studying together but the reality is, is that it's more than just fun. It's more than just exciting. It's life changing when we read the Bible together. And how neat it is. I was at, uh, we had a week of prayer this week at the academy and it was our afterglow time. And one of our seniors mentioned that they started reading through the Bible together as a friend group and how neat it is to be able to talk to one another about what they have been reading throughout the day and hey wasn't it really cool and this was really neat and this spoke to me how awesome it would be if as a church family we could connect throughout the week too and connect about what we've been reading together in God's word I have uh I would like to um transition from this quiz time, which we've been in God's word. But we're about to worship. We have been worshiping, but we're about to worship the God of the universe. And I want to read to you from our reading this week as a call to worship uh, from Psalm 103. In verse 8, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. And then as I skip down to verse 11, it says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We serve a merciful and gracious God. And that's who we're here to meet with this morning.
Father, this week we've read the stories of how you've demonstrated yourself great in the past. The very name of our church talks about how great you will be in the future. But Lord, we call out to you because we need you now. We have hurting family and friends. We need you now. They need you now. We ask that this service, you, would show yourself good to humanity, to the ones that hurt, to the ones that need you. We ask that your spirit would, would overwhelm this place with your love and mercy. And Lord, may we be humble to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. I invite you to sing our first song with us, number 294, Power in the Blood. Number 294, Power in the Blood. Number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
and I invite you to stand for our opening song, number 103, Oh God, Our Help. Number 103, Oh God, Our Help. Good morning. Contrary to what the bulletin says a little bit, I am not Mr. Garcia, and I would not give you that difficult of a quiz. <laughs> oh, now we find out. So I am the Religious Liberty Director for our church here. Um, and if you're not familiar with Religious Liberty, Religious Liberty is a department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, and uh, uh, Religious Liberty is all about uh, fighting for uh, liberty of conscience. I was trying to think of a, a, a good little definition that I could give you for uh, what religious, religious Liberty is all about. And, and I, I thought of an old Lakota Sioux saying, that says, no man can tell another man what to do. And in my wisdom, I thought about that and wrote that down. And then I looked it up because I wanted to be sure, so I Googled it. Well, I found out that that actually came from the movie Dances with Wolves. So, um, so I went back to Google and I tried to find another one. And I sure enough did find something very similar, also from the Lakota Sioux. And it says, force no matter how concealed, begets resistance. And I think that every one of us here can kind of relate to that. In other words, we want to have liberty of conscience. We want to follow our conscience. We want to follow God's leading in our life, and we need to be open to his word, and we need to be open to his voice. I would like to read from you just a really short little excerpt from the Great Controversy on page uh, 493. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, homage that springs from an intelligent application of his character. He takes no pleasure in forced allegiance, and all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. God doesn't force us to believe in him. It's our choice. And when you think about it, with pure love, isn't that the way it can only be? No one wants someone to love them out of force. 
You know, our government was created, you know, almost 250 years ago now. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is still this great experiment in democracy. The Constitution, uh, the First Amendment, the amendments to the Constitution are known as the Bill of Rights. And the First Amendment in part says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And it includes two complementary protections in here. Number one, the right, to, the right to religious belief and expression. And number two, a guarantee that the government neither prefers religion over religion nor favors particular faiths over others. Okay? So that is our guarantee in the Constitution of the United States. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that the end times are going to be rapid times. We know there's going to be changes happening in our government, and we know that religion will be forced at us, on us in one day. And we need to be prepared. We need to wrap our minds in God's Word and in the message for His last time people. Now, uh, what we have for religious liberty, your free will offering will go towards religious liberty. And most of you have in your bulletins a, a little pamphlet like this. And if you did not get one, there are more when you, when you exit uh, up at the, the front uh, there. Uh, and there is also a, a, they call it a little freedom bond. And if you feel so inclined, we would like you to contribute um, uh, to religious liberty, uh, and with the use of the Freedom Bond, you can, you can actually get um, a magazine, uh, it comes out every other month, uh, that for yourself, and I think it's like $6.50, uh, minimum contribution of $6.50, it's pretty cheap for a magazine nowadays, um, but there's also an opportunity for if there's someone that you know, someone that's especially in a legal profession, and maybe you want to send that to their office, we would also need their name and their complete address in there. Uh, this campaign will last until the 1st of March, so it doesn't need to be put in today, uh, any time until the 1st of March. And the last thing I'd like to mention is that being an educator also, okay, I'm going to remind you of your homework, and then I have one short little addition to this. Okay, uh, so your homework, uh, number one, study your Sabbath school lesson, okay? This is really important. Every day that we, you can find, you know, a, a small amount of time that you can put aside that you can, that you, can you know, read the Sabbath school lesson. And I know as teachers, the teachers of the Sabbath school lessons just love it when people are, are all ready to go and fired up and talk about the lesson. Number two, this isn't from me, this is from our pastor, we have uh, a daily reading to get through the Bible. Now, I've started that daily reading and did not do very well on that quiz. <laughs> oh, well, I guess I need to read deeper. Um, but uh, I found out things that I had forgotten, you know, and, and it's just a wonderful opportunity to do this. And now, number three, if you get a chance today, uh, the great controversy, great controversy, chapter 35, is called Liberty of Conscience Threatened. And I think it provides some really good insights to what possibly could be coming, in my own opinion, in a relatively short amount of time. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today. We, we praise your name. We want to do your will in our lives. Now I, I ask that each and every person here will be blessed for being here, blessed for listening to us on the radio or watching us from home. And may you guide our hearts, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Lisa. We are so blessed with beautiful music at this church. Children, it is your time. So please go around. Come and grab a basket here in the front or in the back. Go around and collect some offerings so that more children can attend Cedar Lake Elementary School. Look at the platform. That's a healthy church. I got a story for you this morning, but it has to have a scripture reading before I get started. So I'm going to read you a text out of the Bible. So you listen carefully. This comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you 
an expected end. That's out of the King James. If you read it out of the New King James, it says to give you a future. How about that? What's a future? And hope. What's hope? I want to tell you a story about a little boy who learned what a future and hope meant. I want to tell you about a little boy about 65 years ago. His mama used to sing a lot. When she was driving in the car, she'd sing at the windshield. She was called an alto. She kind of sang low. Not real low, but kind of sang low. But this little boy, when he would sing with his mama, he'd sing at the windshield from the back seat, and he sang kind of high. Some of the other boys would kind of tease him. He would sing really high. He could make his voice bounce right off the windshield. They called him a boy's soprano. He didn't know what that meant. But people liked to hear him, hear him sing for Sabbath school and, and sing for church. And his mama decided that he should have music lessons, learn how to sing better. And so this little boy went, stayed after school, and one of the teachers at his school Mrs. Burby, how about that for a name? Began to try to teach him how to sing better. She worked quite a while. One day every week, she would try to help him to sing better. And one day about 58 years ago, 59 years ago, he went to his usual voice lesson and began to warm up and she was playing scales on the piano and he would sing those scales and he got to a note and he got an intense itch right down there. So intense he had to cough and hack and he finally got rid of the itch and they started over again. And they started up the scales, and they got to exactly the same note, and there was that intense itch. Oh, it almost hurt. It was so intense. And he had to cough and hack some more to get rid of that itch. And the teacher said, Mrs. Burby said, why don't you go get a drink of water? So he went over to the wall fountain, you know, the drinking fountain hooked on the wall, and he got a big drink of water, and he came back, and she says, are you okay? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Let's do it again. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this little boy started up the scales again, got to exactly the same note, and exactly the same intense itch started, and he couldn't go any farther. Mrs. Burby pushed her piano stool back from the piano, and she walked over to the classroom telephone. In those days, those telephones hung on the wall, and they had a dial on them. And she had to go zing, zing, zing. And she said, <clears throat> this is Mrs. Burby. I've talked to you about this before, but I think this is the end. The end. That little boy was listening and he thought, the end of what? Well, I can tell you what it was the end of. He was no longer a boy's soprano. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Burby says, it'll probably take four to six years. And that's how long it took before he could start singing again. 
But when he started to sing again, he took voice lessons again. And when he sang, he sang, Glory to God in the highest. And that's about as high as he could go. He was a baritone or a bass or somewhere down there. He wasn't sure. But his mama always sang the alto part with him when he was a boy soprano. So the music teacher decided that he should sing in the choir. So where did the music teacher put him? In the back row, right next to a girl that sang the alto part. So he tried to sing. He couldn't hear the baritone part. He didn't even know what that was. <laughs> so he tried to sing the alto part and off the blow. And sometimes he could do that. <laughs> Took him a while to learn the baritone part. But six years before, he thought it was the end. And God had thoughts for him, thoughts of a future, and thoughts of hope that was different than a boy's soprano. God had thoughts for a bear tone. And he enjoyed that very much. You see, we have ideas sometimes that God has this all figured out and we know right where we're supposed to be. But God does have it all figured out and he knows where he wants us to be in the future. So remember that change is good and that God has a plan to change you. And it doesn't stop when you become a grown-up. It continues because God has thoughts for you for your future and for hope. There's your story for this morning. Let's bow our heads and have prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to never lose the excitement of change. Help us to never lose sight of the hope that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. In our reading this week, we read in Psalm 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. If you are able, I invite you to kneel with me. Father, it's so good that we can call you Father. And thank you for being such a good, good Father to us. We bow down in an act of humility because we have no other choice when we're coming before the God who made heaven and earth. And yet, Although you are 
great beyond our imagination and our capacity to truly comprehend, you chase after us. And that's just hard to imagine too. Because we know ourselves, we know our sinfulness, we know our mistakes, we know our shame and our guilt, and yet you desire to be close to us, and that is just so awesome. Thank you that you love us unconditionally, and thank you that you continue to pursue us with reckless abandon. And this morning, Father, we want to say that we love you too. And we want to accept your love, and we want to, in our feeble attempt, demonstrate our love to you through our worship this morning. And we want to give you the only thing that we can give you, and the only thing that you ask us to give you, and that's our heart. But we can't even do that on our own, so help us to do that. Father, this morning, as a church family, we are we're hurting because we have had some losses. And just a few feet from me here to my left is a family who's really hurting. And Father, you have promised the Holy Spirit, not only as a counselor, but as a comforter. And Lord, we want to invite the Holy Spirit to comfort our church family as a whole, but specifically the Gulick family. I pray that you would draw near to them. I pray that as a church family, we would draw near to them. And Lord, I pray that you would provide peace and comfort and a way forward and, and vision and sight of the future in which you will guide and you will lead because you've promised to do so. I also think of the Drum family and I pray, Lord, that you would draw near to them and comfort them. And Lord, there are others. There are others in our church who are suffering right now with physical illness there are some who are suffering with loss. There are some who are suffering with depression and anxiety and all sorts of different bombardments from the devil. There are some of us in this church who are struggling with temptation, with sin, with sinful habit, habits. There are some of us in this church who are struggling with insecurities, with not knowing what our next step will be. I think of seniors in high school and academy wondering a few months from now where they're heading. And Lord, I pray that you will give direction, that you will give peace to all of us. And Father, this morning I want to lift up my brother and my pastor, Pastor Jacob. I pray, Lord, that you would in a very unique and special way, draw near to him right now. Give him the words to speak to us. Speak to us through your servant, Pastor Jacob. But may it be you, may it be your Holy Spirit that is speaking to his heart. So that when we walk out of this building, when we walk out of this room today, we will be changed and we will have drawn nearer and closer to you. Lord, this is our prayer, not because we deserve you, your mercy and your grace and you answering our prayer, but because you are a great father and you love to give good gifts. So we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
morning. So many of us in this church have uh, suffered losses recently that are very difficult to get through. For me, the loss of my stepbrother Steve has been um, by far the most difficult loss, personal loss in my life. Because he was somebody that I was with on a fairly regular basis. It leaves a hole in your life. Just this morning, um, I saw brief, briefly a gentleman, the back of his head, and just briefly I thought, oh, there's Steve, and then just for an instant I was going to go up and clap my hand on his shoulder and say hi to him. That's why when uh, Gina Carter asked me to sing this song, I thought it was such an appropriate choice. Um, when we experience personal loss in our lives, we don't always understand why God may have allowed it. Um, sometimes we can see the fruits of it. For me, um, I've heard from several acquaintances and friends of mine of people, because of the loss of Steve and the life that he lived, have re-examined their own mortality, their own spiritual lives, and now are coming back to church for the first time in years and sometimes decades. And I've heard several instances of that, and I have no doubt that the seeds of Ben's loss will yield some miraculous results as well. As I look back on this road I've traveled I've seen so many times He's carried me through And there's one thing that I've learned in my life My Redeemer is faithful and true my Redeemer is faithful and true Everything He has said He will do And every morning His mercies are new My Redeemer is faithful and true My heart rejoices when I read the promise There is a place I am preparing for you And I know I'll see my Lord face to face Cause my Redeemer is faithful and true my Redeemer is faithful and true Everything He has said He will do And every morning His mercies are new My Redeemer is faithful and true and in every situation He has proved His love for me When I lack the understanding He gives more grace to me My Redeemer is faithful and true Everything He has said, He will do. And every morning, 
His mercies are new My Redeemer Is faithful and true My Redeemer Is faithful And true Scripture reading this morning is from Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8. And it came to pass when then began to multiply, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that is also his flesh. Yet his days shall be in be a hundred and twenty years. There was giants on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in, unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repeated, excuse me, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repenteth me that I made, that I have made them but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's good to see so many of you at church today. Good to see so many of the little ones in church today. There's something special about reading Scripture through, not in little little chunks, but reading with a plan to, to kind of read the whole thing through. And I just really appreciate this time that we can spend together. I was blessed this week. If if funerals can be a blessing, there was a gentleman sitting a few rows or pews back, and um, during some of the worship pieces of that of that um, funeral service, he felt like he had the freedom to worship God. If you were here, you may have seen this gentleman raise his hands up in complete surrender to the Lord. And I was so blessed by seeing that because he was free to worship God. I want to be free to worship God. And I was really blessed by that. I was blessed by many other things. 
And uh, my heart goes out to the families that have lost a dear one. We as a church we can learn through these experiences that we can become closer together. And I just want to encourage us to continue to learn how to minister to one another in this time. I want to pray. Lord, a few requests that have been made to me is is that um, Linda Galvin is needing special prayer. There's a worry about her kidneys and cancer, and I ask that you would just grant her your grace and mercy. Lord, I want to pray for Owen Connor and the Connor family as they're getting sick with COVID. Lord, I want to ask that you'd lift them up, that you'd protect them, especially Owen. Lord, as I speak your message today, I want to ask that your Holy Spirit would be here and that we would respond in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to mention two spiritual announcements, which I maybe should have done before I prayed, but they're spiritual. We're in the midst of 10 days of prayer. So this afternoon, we're going to have our 10 days of prayer at 4.30 here. And just before our 10 days of prayer, we're going to be challenged with um, going out to the community in the warmth of the winter solstice and uh, try to gather in people who are interested in health and community service and uh, if people have spiritual desires, just we're going to meet a couple people, do some old-fashioned door-to-door, and try to bless people. So that's going to be at 3 o'clock, and 4.30 is going to be a time when we can pray. And if there's ever a time that our church needs to get together and pray, it's today's the time. Now's the time. Last week, we looked at Genesis 1 and 2 and a few of the Psalms that were in our Bible reading plan, it was muting God, and uh, this week it's we have a sermon title called "Calling on God." Quiz number two: Where is this? South America. This is a place that's on the bucket list that I'll never go. Most likely not go, but maybe Jeff's doubting. Maybe he thinks I'm going to go. It's Patagonia. So back in uh, 2019, my sister-in-law had plans to go to Patagonia. And she spent six weeks there. She got there in January of 2020. And there she is. She is an avid rock climber. She, uh, she is a, what, she lives in New Zealand she, she actually trains with Nordic skiing with, actual, with Olympians. She's that class of, a, of a, a sports person. And she climbs, and she's been all over the world climbing, and she spent six weeks climbing, and this is a picture of her climbing. It's pretty impressive. I would not do this. This is not my style. Here she is, and this is... Uh, just kind of gives you the context of, it's a pretty big drop. This is in Patagonia. She makes it to the top, and this is, this is what she does for six weeks. She's in the middle of a mountainous nowhere of January 2020 into February and March, and then she gets out six weeks later, and she has a wake-up call. What was the wake-up call? She woke up to a whole new world. All of a sudden, like, she couldn't get back to New Zealand where she lived. Everything was going crazy. We remember it. We're kind of still in the midst of it. Wake up call. When you're reading through the Bible and you, you get to Genesis 6, it's like a, like a wake up call. It's like, what? 
So let's read it together in Genesis 6, 5, and 6, 11, and 12. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. The context before it doesn't, I mean, yeah, we, there, was a, there was a line that was bad, and, but there's a line that was good. It doesn't really say this overwhelming wickedness is all over the world. And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. Verse 11 and 12, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh has corrupted their way on the earth. When you read Genesis 6, it's like, whoa, how did it get so bad? That's the question we're going to ask. How How did it get so bad? Here are a couple passages from Patriots and Prophets. It is a law of the human mind that by beholding we become changed. Man will rise no higher than his conceptions of truth and purity and holiness. If the mind is never exalted above the level of humanity, if it is not uplifted by faith to contemplate infinite wisdom and love, the man will be constantly sinking lower and lower. Ask yourself this week, what have you been focused on? Next one, a little bit longer. Polygamy, speaking of the antediluvian world again from Patriots and Prophets, polygamy had been early introduced contrary to the divine arrangement at the beginning. The Lord gave to Adam one wife, showing his order in that respect. But after the fall, men chose to follow their own sinful desires. And as a result, crime, Wretchedness rapidly increased. And then Jesus, of course, we know this connection. He says, like it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be also in the days of the Son of Man. He's saying like, just like it was filled with violence and wretched, it's going to be just like that. And I just looked up a, a stat in Pew Research. It says the U.S. murder rate rose by nearly a third in 2020. So if you, look at that, if you look at that middle one where it says includes terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, it rose 30% in 2020. We are, we are living in a violent culture. Does anyone recognize where this is? This is my home bank that I grew up in. And five days ago it was robbed which was a little bit alarmed to me because at least that part of Grand Rapids I haven't known to be um, so criminal. But here it was robbed just five days ago. My friend, Pastor Garrett Morgan, he went to, uh, he, was, he was doing a vacation over in Washington State. And I guess in Washington State and also in Kent County, catalytic converters are hot as you can, you cut them off and you sell them because I guess the precious metals in there, like it, it, ro- it surged by 815% in 2021. These are just random facts of theft and murder in our world. And, and this is just, these two things, uh, the last two are just hit home because one was my hometown, another one, it just recently happened in Washington when they were parked, it, they got up and all of a sudden of his suburban, that Cadillac converter was gone. And I, I didn't know that Cadillac converters were like something people wanted because precious metals and it was hard to come by, so people are finding it other ways. I know somebody has a Suburban. <laughs> Maybe an offering. How did it get like this? Yeah, I can just imagine a deacon's passing a plate and here Pastor Ackenberger puts his Cadillac converter right there. I can see that happening. So how did it get like this? How, how, did, how did the world, how did then and how did... Then and how do, now, how did it get so bad? Genesis 6 1 and 2 says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth. Now, that was the, that was the desire of God with Adam and Eve. You know, be fruitful and multiply. So, this, this is looking pretty good. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. That this, this is, this is kind of where we get a little confusing. 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. They took wives for themselves of, who, of all whom they chose. So this is, this is, yeah, they're multiplying, but then it says the sons of God. We've got to stop right there because what does it mean when the Bible says sons of God? Who are the sons of God? There are two prominent views. Two prominent views. Angels are sons of God. Or men are sons of God. And the, one of the prominent views is angels. And they, they do have some biblical precedent for this. If you look in the Job chapter 1, verse 6, it talks about the, ang- the sons of God gather around the table, and then the devil comes in, and, and they chat with God. So, and there's other references of sons of God m- referring to angelic beings in the Bible. There's also references of sons of God referring to men. What does the context say? Any scholar will know that when you look at Genesis 6, it doesn't really have the context to say angels. Where do they get the idea of angels? They get the idea of angels from a pseudepigrapha book, which is a, a book that never made it into the canon called First Enoch. It was written about 200 B.C. And the clever author said, I'm going to name this Enoch, because Enoch's a biblical character. But it wasn't written by Enoch, and, that, and that's how it kind of tricks people. And Enoch was written in a time when the Jews were f- so fascinated with and built theories about and, and almost mythologies about angels. This is why the book of Hebrews, which is our Sabbath school quarterly, deals with angels in the first couple of chapters because in that time, the Jews w- almost worshipped angels. So they get this idea that Genesis is talking about angels because it comes from an uninspired book that's written in the Maccabean time period, which is around 200 B.C. Well, the context says nothing about this. And then people will say, well, it's this way, and they have all these reasons, but what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say about angels? This This is so clear to me. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. What is Jesus saying about angels? They don't marry. And what does that imply? They don't procreate. Right. Angels are genderless. So, So, but then they say, I hear people say, and I read it on the... I read it on the internet, and that must mean it's true, so I have to double check here. Um, there's, then they say, oh yeah, we know this text, but there's different classes of angels. That when angels fall, all of a sudden they got reproduction, reproductive organs. Like, I, they didn't actually say that, but that's kind, of the, that's kind of the jump they make. So fallen angels can procreate. I'm kind of confused a little bit, but that's okay. Um, so, and they get this idea from this first Enoch book. But in reality, if you're claiming that the whole world got into sin because angels had procreated with, with humans, and that's why the world's so bad, you've, you've made an excuse for why there's sin. It's not humans' fault anymore. It's, it's the angels, the bad ones. So I, I, don't, I don't adhere to this idea. So let's, let's go on to perhaps a more biblical concept here. In Genesis chapter 4 and chapter 5, chapter 4 follows, two, it follows the line of Cain. If Adam's the trunk, we have the two lines coming off. In Genesis 5, it follows Seth. In Genesis 4, it follows Cain. 
And we know the story of Cain. Cain became a rebel, and, and this, is, this is the way he lived all his life, and this is the way he taught all his children. So from the very beginning, we see this line that was, was rebellious. Then we see the line that follows Seth. And the seventh of each line shows kind of a crystal clear character. The seventh in Genesis 5 following Seth was Enoch. And Enoch followed God so faithfully that one day he was making a a step forward and God says, hey, why don't you just step into my kingdom? Because he was righteous. He loved Jesus. So the seventh from Adam was Enoch. But the seventh from Adam on on the Cain side was Lamech. And Lamech has a song in Genesis 4 bragging about how sinful he is. So the seventh from Adam in both sides shows a perfection of of character, a perfection of good and a perfection of evil. And so these two lines continue. Here is in a third spiritual gifts, third volume. But when men multiplied upon the earth, the descendants of Seth saw that the daughters, that the daughters of the descendants of Cain were very beautiful. So what, what was happening? They started to be attracted, not to godliness anymore. There started to be a slight compromise of not going after a godly spouse, but going after somebody who who could please their senses, please their desires. It was very beautiful. And they departed from God and displeased him by taking wives as they chose of the adulterous race of Cain. So this simple question, how does one become a son of God? Let's go to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 35. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 35. Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. I like that echo. Pastor, get it straight. Here's a transition of the of the lines. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son named, Seth, named him Seth. For God had appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also was a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. That's a, that's a huge key, uh, clue here. Calling on the name of the Lord. Throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, when you start calling on the name of the Lord, it's saying something of your status with God. Of course, Cain's descendants never called on the name of the Lord. They could never be called sons of God. But when you call on the name of the Lord, you can be a son or a daughter of God. Now look at it in Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. We're going to look at a few verses. I have them in, on the screen here. Joel 2.32 It might be too small for some to read, so get your Bible out. Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. Here it says, we're talking about the, I believe the context of who are the sons of God. Are are sons of God are the ones who call on the name of the Lord. That is that is crystal clear. So so Seth's descendants, from the very beginning, were calling on the name of the Lord. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Look at verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When someone is in a saving relationship with God, they are in the family of God. And when they're in the family of God, they can be called a son or a daughter of God. So from the biblical context, it's very clear that the sons of God are following the line of those who want to be connected to God. And in Genesis 6, we start to see a a slow compromise. And they slowly stop calling on the name of the Lord. They're calling on the daughters of men. And there's a slow compromise taking place. Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8, looking in verse 12. 
We could call the line of Cain the line of the flesh. We could call the line of, of Seth the line of the spirit. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. When we see Enosh following Seth, and he, and he, he cried out to God, he he called out to the name of God. He's basically saying, God, I, I understand that we've been separated because of sin, but I'm calling on your name. I want to be part of your family. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus, they didn't know his name, but they knew the Lamb. We talked about that in our quiz. God made for, for Adam and Eve tunics of skin. They, under, they had faith in the Lamb back then. And faith in the Lamb back then meant faith in Jesus Christ today. So what did we learn? What, how do you become a son of God or a daughter of God? You call on the name of God. You call on the name of God because you realize you're in an unsaved condition. You call on the name of God because you realize you have a spiritless connection. You call on the, the name of the Son of God because you, you want to be filled with His Spirit. What happened in Genesis chapter 6? His spirit could not strive with men anymore because they weren't calling on his name anymore. And his spirit was removed. And when his spirit was removed, all violence broke out even more so. When we call on the name of the Son of God or we call on the name of the, of the Lord, it tells us that we cry out, Abba, Father. And we do this by faith. So if we are to reread, or read, reread Genesis chapter 6, 6, verse 1 through, 3, 1 through 3, and kind of add a little commentary to it. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply, when, when they were growing families and, and spreading, there was a line of, of, of Cain, and they were spreading fast. They were doing whatever they wanted to. They were living however they wanted to. And the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, they were living in a separate area of the faithful, and they started noticing what the Canaanites were doing. They started noticing how they were living. They started to maybe get jealous, or they liked the fashion, or they liked the way they could live, and they started getting attracted to that lifestyle. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. They took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, the word giants in Hebrew means the fallen ones. We can see how the line of, of Seth became fallen. They were calling on the name of the Lord, and they were fallen from the status of being a son or a daughter of God. And also afterward, when the sons or when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, they were born children to them. These were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What started, what started in the antediluvian world, what started this, this 100% imaginative mind only being evil? It was a compromise of the nuclear family. It was a compromise of, of who you're choosing to marry. This is 
simply what the scripture says is of what happened to the antediluvian world. When we choose a spouse who is not choosing the Lord, we're following in the footsteps of the antediluvian world. I have heard I have heard people who have chosen a spouse who's not in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the minority of times it works out. But many times it doesn't work out. And it drags both people in. And that's what happened to this generation. The cause is a slow blending of the way with Seth's way. Cain's way with Seth's way. He compromised here, he compromised there a little bit. In Jude 11, it says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. And maybe it's not a relationship that you're in, but maybe it's a relationship with the world that you've just slowly adapted into your life. And with the recent halts of our attention with two tragic deaths in our church community, and my wife has been commenting that all around are tragic deaths taking place in America. These tragic deaths are a wake-up call. It's like an alarm clock. I kinda, my sister-in-law wakes up to a whole new world. Maybe you wake up to a whole new spiritual understanding, like, whoa, I've been so far away from God all this time, and not, I haven't realized it. And you want to call on the name of the Lord. We're going to read two, two scriptures, and then we'll be done. In Psalm 50, verse 15. And you realize that you've been in a, in a bad way. You haven't been paying attention to the simple things of the Bible. In Psalm 50, verse 15, it says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. If you're in a day of trouble, if you're convicted about the situation that you're in, God invites you to call to him. Because the only way it's going to get better is if you call to him. In Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. He invites us. As he invited the descendants of Noah, he invites us. Call to me, and I will answer you. And show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Oftentimes we think if we do life the way we want to do it, it's going to be better. And God invites us to call to him, and he's going to answer us. He's going to show us great and mighty things, things that we don't even understand. If I'm faithful to God, will I be happy? He's going to show you, not just happy, you have a joy that goes beyond what your heart can even imagine. When we, when we call out to God, sometimes we want to pray the opposite prayer of the Gethsemane prayer. The Gethsemane prayer is, Lord, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will be done. Oftentimes we pray the opposite. Lord, take this cup from me, not your will, my will be done. That's why the antediluvian world failed so fast. They prayed the opposite kind of prayer. Jesus invites us. Call to me. Wherever you're at, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how dark or deep into sin you are. It doesn't matter how bad you may feel. It doesn't matter what kind of circumstances you have. He continually invites us call on the name of the Lord. In our scripture reading, we see in Genesis 4, of our, the reading of the, of the week we read in Genesis 4, call on the name of the Lord. Abraham says it three times. Hagar says it once. Isaac, Isaiah said, or Isaac says it once. Call on the name of the Lord. If you find yourself in trouble, you have a direct access point to go to God. 
find yourself in a troubling relationship that's not giving glory to God, you, have a, you can call on the name of the Lord and he'll help you. Find yourself in an addictive sin, call on the name and he'll help you. If you find yourself not really doing devotions and not really connected to God, you call on the name of the Lord and he'll help you. When you call on the name of the Lord, you're saying, I want to be closer to you. I want to, I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. Is it your desire today to say, Lord, in 2022, I've been going the wrong way last year, and I want to call on the name of the Lord. I know that there's, there's several of you who just recently were baptized. You called on the name of the Lord. You're a child of God. Is it your desire to follow suit in baptism and say, Lord, I've been going the wrong way. I want to call on the name of the Lord. If that's your desire, That's your desire to, to be, at, be at peace with God, to be one with God. Feel like you've been going the wrong way. God has shown me these last two weeks anybody can die at any time. We think someone's healthy. And they can die. The best thing that we can do is call on the name of the Lord at this very present moment. If it's your desire to get close to God, there's a you can do it on your own discretion. There's a few cards. It says get connected. You can take one of those cards before you leave, and you can fill it out. I need to call on the name of the Lord. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe you need to make a prayer and, and you'd like me to connect with you and maybe it's, I need to get, have devotional help. But you want to you get closer to God. There's pew cards in front of you. You can fill that pew card out. There's, there's boxes on these four pillars. You can fill it out. I can connect with you. But right now, let's call on the name of the Lord. Let's make him our father. He wants to be your father. He wanted to be the antediluvian's father, but they were so attracted with going the wrong way, so willing to compromise, so easy to compromise that they just slowly, over the generations, settled into sin. But today, God's calling you, settle into Jesus. Father, They forgot to call on the name of the Lord. Their attention was misguided. And if we're honest, Lord, we forget at times too. But this is a reminder, Lord. We can call to you anytime, anywhere. Lord, our hearts sometimes bent to want the wrong things. We call on the name of the Lord. Help our hearts. Help our minds. We call on the name of the Lord, help our relationships. We call on the name of the Lord, help our devotions. We call on the name of the Lord, help our commitments. We call on the name of the Lord. We want to be children of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing our closing hymn, number 290, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
I invite you this afternoon at 4.30 to come together with your church family and call on the name of the Lord in prayer. We have some big, big things to pray about, and God desires to hear us. So at 4.30, Father, you've given us a simple thing. All through Scripture, those who call on the name of the Lord who find themselves in trouble have, have direct access to you. Father, we call on your name to save. We call on your name to accept. We call on your name to be blessed this Sabbath day. We have such a privilege, and we want to take it for all what it's worth. Bless everybody here, Father. As we go out these doors, lift them up. Shine your face upon them. Give them your warm embrace. Give them everything they need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.